The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, Ben Shapiro exposes the less plan to destroy America in three easy steps. Plus, America's newest singing sensation, The Voice winner Todd Tillman joins us live. And then, a look back at the Detroit riots 50 years later. Are we returning back to where we were? And then some people say, Bishop, it's never changed. I'm like, wow. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Anarchy in the streets of Portland as protesters continue their reign of terror for more than 50 days. Last night, government agents fired tear gas on the unruly mob, including the gentleman of the mayor who had gone out to support the protesters. What was he doing out in the street? And what is the action President Trump now taking to stop this and other violence in America? Here's CBN's Jenna Browder. Portland's mayor met with protesters to rally them against the federal agents using force to protect federal buildings. But when he said he didn't support abolishing the police, the crowd booed him and called on him to resign. Later, as the crowd got out of control, federal agents fired tear gas on the crowd, including the mayor. This kind of violence taking place almost nightly in Portland. CBN contributor Chuck Holton was there earlier this week. There's an undercurrent of tension here, and you can feel it because almost every night for the last couple of weeks, things have gotten significantly more exciting as the night wears on. The crowd swelled after sundown, bringing another element with it black-clad Antifa members armed with baseball bats, high-powered lasers, and homemade shields gathered at the front of the federal building and started trying to break down boarded-up doors. Several minutes later, law enforcement officers from the U.S. Border Patrol's tactical team emerged and pushed the crowd away from the building. As the peaceful protesters quickly backed off, Antifa members in expensive gas masks began throwing bottles and trying to blind the agents with the powerful green lasers. In response, the agents fired tear gas and stun grenades. A little bit of tear gas. That's, uh, that's exciting. Ooh, should have brought a mask. Goggles, things like that. In response to growing violence in America's cities, President Trump announced he's expanding Operation Legend, sending more federal agents to cities starting with Chicago. In recent weeks, there has been a radical movement to defund, dismantle, and dissolve our police departments. Trump making the announcement Wednesday at the White House. We'll work every single day to restore public safety, protect our nation's children, and bring violent perpetrators to justice. It comes in response to rising crime in cities across America, the president blaming their Democrat leaders. Surveillance video shows this drive-by shooting Tuesday in Chicago. At least 15 people were hurt. This year in the Windy City, more than 400 people have been murdered. That number up nearly 50 percent from the previous year. The mayor of Chicago says her team will work with the federal agents, but making clear they're not there to fight protesters. So they're not federal troops. They're FBI, DEA, ATF and they will be plugged in to the, diff uh, the existing infrastructure of those um, agencies. Meanwhile, it's not just the agents the administration is sending to cities. This afternoon, I'm also announcing that the Department of Justice will provide more than $61 million in grants to hire hundreds of new police officers in cities that are the focus of Operation Legend. And while the money may be more welcome than the agents, some mayors are not having it. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio says federal agents are not welcome in his city. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, thanks, Jenna. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this Antifa is, is an organization bent on destruction and uh, destroying America. It has its origins in the fight against Nazi Germany. Uh, it's not an indigenous organization. And Black Lives Matter, we have pointed out the uh, 
three women who organized that organization by that name, two at least said, we are trained Marxist revolutionaries. This is not some indigenous movement. But the idea that they're now using lasers to blind the police, and uh, they're, they've got bats, and they've got uh, a stash of brick bats, and things like that. I mean, it is really serious. And for the mayors to say, like de Blasio said, well, everything is just wonderful in New York. It's not wonderful. And it's revolution, and the idea is to destroy America. And we cannot allow that to happen. But um, the president is having a tough time because the media seems to be uh, on the side of some of these demonstrators, and it's not uh, very helpful. Well, in other news, grim milestones in the COVID-19 crisis. New case cases keep increasing, and so do deaths. John Jessup has more. That is right, Pat. The United States is closing in on 4 million cases and deaths are up 12 percent over last week. The South setting records for fatalities two days in a row now. And 31 states are increasing their efforts to stop the spread, including mandates to wear masks. Meanwhile, here in Washington, D.C., lawmakers are working to pass the next round of economic relief. Senate Republicans expected to begin rolling out elements of their one trillion dollar plan today. One sticking point, extending a $600 a week boost in unemployment benefits, that program is set to expire in coming days. Well, doctors and scientists are learning more about the impact of the virus on patients. We've known from the beginning that COVID-19 takes aim at the lungs, but as Lori Johnson reports, new studies show the damage goes much further. Several medical papers document a wide range of non-respiratory problems caused by COVID-19. In some studies, up to 60% of people who've had the virus developed a neurological issue. Everything from stroke to loss of smell, of course, uh, loss of taste, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a reversible paralysis uh, syndrome, uh, to an encephalitis that has uh, been described as well, uh, to various, uh, of course, muscle pains, headaches. Often these go away, but some, such as stroke effects, can be permanent. Doctors fear there could be other long-term health problems. So there's a lot of ongoing speculation about whether there will be post-COVID Alzheimer's or post-COVID Parkinsonism or other phenomena we just don't know yet. Doctors say it's clear COVID often causes blood clotting, which is particularly concerning for young people who might not realize they're having a stroke and wait too long to get help. Lori Johnson, CBN News. So many unknowns concerning the coronavirus. Pat, back to you. Uh, CBN medical reporter Laurie Johnson is here with us. And Laurie, uh, he was originally thought, well, look, this is nothing more than a bad case of flu. But it's more serious. They've actually, as I understand, begun to do uh, studies of, of the hearts of people who died and find that the tissues of the heart and the tissues of the lungs uh, show tremendous stress. Could you talk about some of these? That's right, Pat. I interviewed the director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Francis Collins. That interview is going to be aired next Tuesday on the 700 Club. And he said that this COVID-19 virus is, quote, diabolical because we've never seen anything like it before. So when it first came out, we started thinking it might be like things that are sort of like it, coronaviruses that are associated with the common cold or SARS or MERS, but it's definitely different. And so now it's been with us about six months and there are some known things about it, such as the blood clotting, which is a very serious issue. And then now you're talking about uh, issues with the heart. I had the neurologist talking about issues with the brain and it still remains to be seen what kind of long-term impacts there are. We saw with the Spanish flu a hundred years ago, different virus, but that there were some long-term, some Parkinsonism and some other long-term issues. So, so it is very serious, you're right, and we should take it seriously. Regarding the blood clotting, uh, doctors are now trying to nip that in the bud when people ha come in and present positive with COVID-19. There, Many of them are now giving low-dose heparin or other blood thinners and are advising people who are on blood thinners right now to stay on them. Now is not the time to come off, but the concern are people 
people who don't get any medical attention. They're not having serious symptoms and they're at risk for blood clotting. And a lot of them don't know the stroke signs and they need to because these young people are having strokes and waiting a day before they get help. So here are the main stroke signs. First of all, face drooping. So even if you're alone and you're feeling weird, look in the mirror. If your face is drooping, that could be a sign of a stroke. Also, arm weakness. You should be able to hold your arms out like this. If one of them drops down, that's a stroke warning sign. And also difficulty speaking, having garbled speech. Again, even if you're alone, try to say something out loud like the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you can't do that, you want to try to get to that level one stroke center as soon as you can, because every minute, millions of brain cells die. It's good to know right now where the level one stroke center is near you, because oftentimes it's not the closest hospital and ambulances are in many places required by law to take you to the closest hospital. So this is a decision families need to make. Do you want to have someone drive you to a level one stroke center uh, as opposed to not going to the ambulance route? I'm not I'm not advising that. I'm saying this needs to be a discussion ahead of time. Well, you're exactly right. I had a minor stroke and fortunately um, uh, my son was there and and our head of police, they rushed me immediately down to a, a, a hospital that had a stroke center. But the one closest to us didn't have anything like that. My wife was taken there initially, and before she was finished, uh, th this was a major, major problem. Right. But uh, how are people going to know where a level one stroke center is? How are they going to find out? It's on the. It's online. You. It's just it's do a little online. bit invest of investigating in your area. You call your nearby hospitals and just ask them, are you a level one stroke center? This information is on the internet, and if you're not into computers, give your near nearby hospitals a call. But this is legislation that is pending in states all across the country. You know, should should this be a law that if you if an ambulance comes to your home and you're having a stroke, should they be required by law to take you to the nearest hospital or maybe drive a little further to the level one stroke center? And so in places like Ohio, this might be changing. Well, Laurie, you know, this is horrible to think about. Uh, it affects the muscles. It affects the lungs, it affects the heart, it affects the brain, it affects the smelling and the taste, right. your cognition. I mean, this is a horrible thing. How are we going to defend ourselves against this terrible coronavirus? Well, yesterday, President Trump uh, resumed his, well, two days ago, resumed the daily coronavirus briefings. And last night, he was talking about uh, an interesting and grim statistic, which is uh, nursing homes. And so this is something you've been talking about, Pat, for so long, which is a targeted approach to the coronavirus. Listen to this. Nursing home, the people in nursing homes make up 1% of the population, but nearly half of all coronavirus deaths. 1% of the population, almost 50% of the coronavirus deaths. So there's a great attention being paid to what's going on in nursing homes. They're giving them the PPEs. They're giving them the rapid tests, requiring them to report to the state if they have more than three cases so the state can intervene. But we really need to pray for these people in nursing homes. They haven't had visitors for up to six months now, and they're so isolated. And I want to say to our viewers who are in nursing homes right now, we're praying for you. We love you. Seek the Lord Jesus. You will find him, and he can offer the comfort and the peace and even the joy that you require during this pandemic. Uh, we have talked so much about the whole gut flora, uh, but uh, this metabolic syndrome People who, you said the, the 80 percent or so of our immune system is in the gut. Yes. Talk to us about that thing. We, we, we have had so much interest in it, but this is the first line of defense against this terrible coronavirus. Absolutely. You know, the median age of people who die of the coronavirus is 78. Why is that? It's because as we age, our immune system is not as robust as it was when we were younger. And what makes it even worse are these underlying conditions such as uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, 
obesity, heart disease, things like COPD and asthma, congestive heart failure. But uh, one of the things that causes us to have a strong, robust immune system is our gut health. And so we need to do all we can. And we could go for on for hours. You know that about what yeah. makes a, a healthy gut. It's mostly diet and getting those good probiotics in there and avoiding things that are very harmful to the immune system and the gut, which are antibiotics. So if at all possible, try to avoid those. And then, of course, sugar and processed foods. Yeah. And and artificial sweeteners, we right. might add. Right. Don't forget. Well, Lori, thank you for your insights. Folks, we've got to look after ourselves. And, you know, it's in your hands. The government's not going to help you. They, 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 they can do what they can, but you've got to look after yourself. And you need plenty of sleep. You need to take plenty of antibiotics, uh, not antibiotics, but, uh, you know, probiotics. And make sure that you don't get overweight and fat. And if it's a question of watching your diet, watch your diet and look after yourself because uh, the, the, the effects of this coronavirus are far, far more deadly than any of us had dared to dream when it first came out. It's not just a bad flu. It's not just a little cough. It is a major, major health threat to every one of us. Terry? Well, still ahead, he never had a singing lesson in his life. So how did this man win the Voice 2020 competition? He's going to tell you himself. That's coming up. But first, as easy as one, two, three, radio host and author Ben Shapiro tells how to destroy America in three easy steps and what we can do to stop it. He joins us live right after this. A growing number of Americans are trying to tear down this country. How? By canceling our shared history, our ideals, and our culture. Radio host and author Ben Shapiro writes about this dangerous trend in his book, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps. Ben, welcome. It's a fascinating book, and here it is, ladies and gentlemen, How to Destroy America. Uh, ben, talk to me about 1619. Why is that supposed to be an important date? I thought it was 1620. I thought it was 1607. What's 16 and 20? Well, 1619 is, a, is the date that the first African slave arrived on American shores. And according to the New York Times and Nicole Hannah-Jones, who is the de facto editor over there now, 1619 is the true founding of the United States. America really is not about the liberty of 1776. It is not about the history of Jamestown. It's not about Plymouth Rock. America is really about slavery. All of the institutions of the United States are built on the bedrock of bigotry and racism and cruelty toward others. And therefore, the entire system must be torn down. The New York Times has promulgated the 1619 Project with millions of dollars. They're going to try and teach it in public schools. Nicole Hannah-Jones won a Pulitzer Prize for an essay that was so bad that four other Pulitzer Prize winning historians said that the, his that the history was just pseudo history. But it doesn't matter. It's about attempting to destroy all the ties that bind us. If we don't share a vision of American history that says America is a great and good country that was rooted in excellent, enduring principles in the Declaration of Independence, that we haven't always lived up to those principles. The story of America has really, really dark periods and really dark spots. But the story of America is about how we overcame the endemic nature of human sin in order to create a better America and a better world by extension by living up to those founding principles. Instead of saying that that's our history, instead, the 1619 Project and and disintegrationists, as I call them, like to claim that America's real story is a story of exploitation, brutality, and evil. Well, Ben, you know, 1619, if the New York Times is pushing it, we, we, we've done a story about the Ox and the Salzburger family that came up from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, they gave money to the Stone Mountain Project that had a statue of Robert E. Lee, and uh, they, had, they not only ha owned slaves, they bought and sold slaves, and they have the New York Times. How in the world can a family that does that come up with a 1619 nonsense? I think the basic idea here is that the only good people who have ever been born live right now. It's a, it's a very anti-Judeo-Christian worldview, that human sin is actually only a product of the systems that, that human beings live in. Right? If you're Jewish or if you're Christian or if you believe the Judeo-Christian worldview, if you're religious of any sort, actually, you tend to believe that human beings are endemically sinful, that human beings have the capacity for sin, and that 
the fact that human beings have done bad things over the course of history is not always the result of a system. But if you are a member of the disintegrationist left, then what you actually believe is that human beings are widgets that are that are surrounded by forces beyond their control. And that if we just change those forces, human beings will be good. And so the idea is that all inequalities in modern American life and all past inequalities, all past evils, those can be attributed to systems. And, and that, that's exactly what you see from the, the New York Times. As far as the, the Sulzberger family, obviously they're hypocrites. But, you know, the way that they buy off the, the woke left is by simply ignoring their own hypocrisy or apologizing for, the, for, their, for their ancestors, for apologizing for people who died long ago and, and suggesting that they are themselves different. And they're so different, they're going to hand the keys to the car to people who really don't like the country very much. Ben, ben, in, in your book, what you're pointing out is that everything in our society uh, is, is somehow controlled by racism and that the, the black people were uh, taken advantage of and it's because of them. You, you pointed out that they want reparations and you said you've got uh, uh, an immigrant of three or four generations that's come in from someplace in, in Eastern Europe and he's got to pay money to Colin Powell because of the sins against his ancestors. They're asking for reparations now. How do you pay reparations for slavery? Now, the case for reparations is extraordinarily weak, but the case for reparations is again based on the idea that the story of America is unending sin. The, the claim is not just that slavery was a bad thing that happened a very long time ago and has you know, after effect. The claim is that America really never got past slavery that slavery transmuted into Jim Crow and Jim Crow didn't end. Jim Crow just transmuted into what they call systemic racism. This is the case that's made by people like Robin DiAngelo. It's a case made by Ibram Kendi. It's a case made by ta Coates. Uh, all these folks basically claim that what racism really is, is not the belief that a group is inferior or superior based on race. That's what normal people think racism is. Instead, what they say racism is, is any system that ends with any level of racial inequality is a racist system. And if you don't fight the system, then you are not anti-racist. That's the language that you're seeing being used right now. So if you're not for slavery reparations, that's because you're not for tearing down the system. And that's because you are, in fact, complicit in racism. It's a, it's a really dangerous ideology. And it's an ideology that destroys the foundations of the freest and, by the way, most tolerant society ever devised by man. America 2020 is the most tolerant society on planet Earth. Well, you pointed out, you've gone through some very interesting history, but we did have some problems along with the, uh, we couldn't have gotten the uh, Constitution ratified if we hadn't changed a few things in it, uh, having to do with giving a percentage of the people in the Electoral College to the, the slaves. Uh, but you, you, in your book, you're saying that Capitalism, as we know it in America, is, is essentially racist, that everything that we see and of any of the good things in America, they're all founded on racism and the money that was brought about because of slavery. Is, is that the, the, the prevailing um, norm? And that is the disintegrationist claim. That is the claim that's being made by people in the media, is that all the things you see in American life, all the systems that surround you, everything from how you get your iPhone to the Internet, to traffic patterns, all of these things are rooted in slavery. Now, that's historically inaccurate, but it does allow for a, a group of people who really don't like the American system and wish to rebuild it in a different way, in a sort of utopian mold. It, it allows them to argue that even though America is indeed prosperous, free, and generous, that America actually is rooted in brutality, and therefore the system has to go no matter how many people it has helped. And, and the fact of the matter is that America is the most prosperous, free, generous nation in the history of the world. Seeing it as the opposite, seeing it as endemically cruel and bigoted, and not looking at American history as the story of overcoming in, in, human sin in order to fulfill the principles of the founding, which, by the way, is what Martin Luther King talked about, as what Frederick Douglass talked about. Both of them talked about fulfilling the promises of the Declaration of Independence, not about tearing down the Declaration of Independence. If you talk about tearing down the Declaration, what you're talking about is tearing down the country. There are a lot of people rooting for that right now. Yeah, well, Ben, I appreciate his call. How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps. And to think that there are people who really believe that, who believe that America started in 1619 with the introduction of the first uh, black slave, that that was the start of America. It's just nonsense. I mean, it's, it's nonsense. And the truth was the slavery held the South back. It became an agricultural society. And it could not compete in the world because it was bringing products that were at the vagaries of the market. Whereas in the North, they had no slavery. And uh, as a result, they were prosperous. And, and in the Civil War, that was fought having to do with slavery in some fashion. And 
the North prevailed. I've just been reading a, a biography of, uh, of General Grant. Very interesting uh, how the, the country evolved. And you look at the Ku Klux Klan, the other stuff in the South, but that was terrible. But our institutions were set up by people who believed in, in, in forming one of the greatest nations on the face of the earth. And we cannot say that every gain we have in America, that all of our capitalism, all of our information, the iPhone and all the stuff that we have is a result of racism. That's just utter nonsense. But if you believe it, it's being taught in the schools in America. And it shouldn't be. But Ben Shapiro has written a book, How to Destroy America. It's an interesting book, and he goes through a whole lot of things that we didn't talk about, about the founding of America and how they, they had the... Uh, well, they had to cater, in a sense, to the South on some of these matters, but the South got beat during the Civil War. <laughs> like it or not, uh, Lincoln did prevail. We don't want to take his stature down because he really did uh, uh, make an Emancipation Proclamation. And so we have some more to go, sure, but uh, uh, we're still the best nation on the face of the earth, and let's not forget it. It's right. just troubling that history can be so skewed so easily. Well, it, it depends on who writes the history. Yeah. I wow. mean, seriously, I mean, who teaches it and who writes it? If this, this doctrine is taught in the schools that Ben is saying in this book it is, then this becomes the prevailing ethos is that America is not essentially good and that we, we didn't really make the best nation on the face of the earth. But everything that we have good is a result of, of, of oppression of the black race. That's nonsense. It's utter nonsense. But people, I mean, you know, little kids don't know any better. If they're taught that in the school, that's what they're going to get. Well, some adults don't know yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. but to think of the hypocrisy of the New York Times, I mean, yeah. that is appalling. I mean, they didn't just own slaves. They bought them and sold them. The Ox Salzberger family that owned the New York Times, they had ads in the paper. I have got some Along with our general merchandise, we've also got some black people we're going to sell you. If, if, and here they're good. They're, they're good workers and this kind of thing. I mean, it was documented in the New York Post. I mean, Today, though, people don't seem to be always interested in, in, in the looking facts. at facts. Exactly. Yes. Oh, well, that's the whole thing. I mean, you know, you, you just shoot somebody down. If they disagree, if they're not politically correct, you do not give them promotion in school. Uh, in college, you, you don't get promotion. If you say something is a, a, a contrary to the ethos, you can't have a TV show. I mean, it's it's incredible the uh, uh, intellectual uh, blanket that's come across our country, and we don't want to have that. We want to tell you the truth, and we want to know the truth because Jesus said, "You will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free." Terry. That is correct, and still to come, informative, entertaining, and always unpredictable. Your questions and some honest answers. Patty says, should a Christian sell wine at wine-tasting parties? Hmm, wonder what Pat will say to that. Plus, he's a pastor, a husband, and the father of eight children. Todd Tillman is also the winner of The Voice 2020. How did he do it? Find out after this. If you're a fan of NBC's The Voice competition, you know when contestants try out, they're praying that just one of the judges will turn around and pick them. Well, during Todd Tillman's audition, all four judges swung around in their seats. So it's no wonder that Tillman wound up the 2020 winner. Pastor Todd Tillman grew up singing in church, but never had professional training. Todd's wife and a friend encouraged him to try out for an NBC show called The Voice. He reluctantly agreed. Not only did he have all four judges trying to get Todd on their team, but Todd was also declared the 2020 season 18 winner of The Voice. He's here to talk about his journey. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Todd Tillman. Todd, it's great to have you with us today. Hey, you, thank you so much. You had never sung professionally when you went on The Voice. Were you stunned when all four judges spun around? What were you thinking? Uh, yeah, certainly I was. Like, I, you know, I, everyone kept asking me beforehand, like, 
which one of these coaches would you like? And I was like, I'm going to go with whichever one turns around. <laughs> <laughs> I was completely, completely stunned when all four of them turned. Well, there was a point where you almost skipped auditioning for The Voice. What happened yeah. there and what changed your mind? Uh, well, my, I'll tell you, first of all, we had just had a super busy time in our lives. But second of all, and really more prevalent, I think, I just assumed that, um, that I would just get a no. You know, and so I was like, why would I drive? Because I had to drive several hours to go to the audition. And uh, But what changed my mind was my wife. We've, we've said a million times in our marriage that she's the gas and I'm the brakes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so she just pushed me over the edge to do it. You chose, after all four turned around, to work with Blake Shelton as your coach. What was that like? That was as great as I thought it would be. Um, I, I chose him hoping that what I had seen of him was was genuine, which is just that he's kind of easygoing and laid back, really professional uh, as well. And it, it, that was all true. He, you know, he's not such a stickler. That just would have made me too nervous. <laughs> Speaking of nervous, because of COVID-19, the regular production of the show was changed. And that actually helped you a little bit with nerves. Talk about that. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say this, you know, the audience part of it was great. I, I love an audience. So the, the audience didn't make me so nervous, but it did help uh, that I was sort of in my own environment. You know, uh, like a lot of people have asked about the audience, but that's really not it. I love the audience. You know, they're great and there's a lot of energy, but I was sort of in my own environment. And also, I would say for me, the most nerves or anxiety or whatever you want to say came from my company, that all of the other artists were so great, you know, and I was in a competition with them. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit the show finals. You saying, I can only imagine, uh, you know, that that was a, a very popular song, of course, but it's uh -huh. it's been sung so much. Did you think you were going to win? Uh, no, I'll, I can tell you just categorically, we, I actually uh, just assumed that I wouldn't win. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're a pastor. You're the dad of eight children. Winning this has to have impacted your life. How has that changed your family's life? Uh, our family, you know, remarkably, uh, you would think that when something like this happens and there's so many more things happening that, that especially myself that I have to do, that it would sort of be like hard to come together. But I actually think this has caused us to come even closer. We've always been a really close family, you know, um, but I think it caused us even to come closer together. Everybody's really on board with, with what, what's happening. And then, um, and then also there are other opportunities that have come up that really focus on our entire family, not just me and what happened yeah. on the show, you know. Are your kids musical? A couple of them are. All of my kids, uh, especially, you know, the ones that are older and you mm -hmm. can see their gifts, you know, that as they develop. Um, but even the little kids, um, uh, they all have really, really remarkable gifts. And a couple of them are musical. So is this a new career for you? I understand that you have a CD, you've got a, a book possibility and a reality TV show in the offing. What does the future look like for you? You know, uh, I... I don't really know. I, I like what I'm. I'm not really releasing. When you when I say a CD, I'm not really like releasing any new music. What I'm doing is I'll have a CD. I have a show right now that's uh, that's in the in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and so I'm just releasing a CD that's got a few of those songs on it, and it's not going to be like digital or anything. Uh, but yeah, there's a book thing, uh, and so I what I've said a hundred times really is that I know my life and our family's lives are drastically changing, but the exact parameters of that, we're just sort of having faith and letting them play out. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't really know what they are. What's your heart with all of this, Todd? What's your dream? What I would love to do, uh, and I, you know, this is another thing that I've said a, a bunch of times. I would love to share my faith and my family and who I am uh, with with the world and that and that I like show the world that there's someone like me who just loves them, you know, unconditionally. I just love you, but maybe not necessarily package it in a way that is just so strictly only faith based. You see what I mean? Yes. Uh, like so that hopefully other people might look into it and say, like, you know, here's a regular 
everyday guy and he took a chance, you know, and look, it paid off and he's still sort of regular. <laughs> yeah. Well, can I say that when this COVID thing is over and concerts are allowed again, you're going to need a big RV. <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're actually, that's a weird, it, it's just such a weird time in my life. <laughs> it's a weird time in all of our lives. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Seriously. Well, we congratulate you on your win. How very exciting. And we pray God's blessing and favor on you, on your family. And that that picture you paint that, you know, with God at the center, all things Thank are possible you. is when we we embrace. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Great to talk to you. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, still ahead, a city under siege captured through the lens of a photojournalist. What happened 53 years ago today and what can we learn from it now? That's coming up. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Presumptive Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden wants more people to be taught about Islam in our public schools. That's what he told attendees at the Muslim Voters Summit this week. Biden called Islam, quote, one of the great confessional faiths. The Muslim Voters Summit hopes to rally one million Muslims to go to the polls in November to defeat President Trump. Well, archaeologists have unearthed a major discovery in Jerusalem. It's a huge stone wall structure dating back around 2,700 years from the time of King Hezekiah and his son Manasseh. The building is believed to have been used for government activities. Researchers discovered 120 jar handles with seal impressions in ancient Hebrew. Many of them had LMLK on them, which means belonging to the king. Other handles have the names of senior officials and other important men. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Fifty-three years ago today, one of the deadliest, most destructive riots in America exploded in the city of Detroit, Michigan. Most of the conflict was between black residents and the police department. Does that sound familiar? So that's what's happening in parts of America today. Just watch, 50 years. July 23, 1967, one of the most destructive riots in our nation's history took place in Detroit, Michigan. Many were killed and the city was left in ruins with the community uncertain if their lives could ever be rebuilt. My father, Detroit photojournalist James D. Wilson, captured the unfolding events. The results are displayed at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History and a photographic exhibit called, Say It Loud, Art, History, Rebellion. Museum curator, Patrina Chapman. He documented what was going on and he tried to make the city leaders understand what was happening, but they didn't quite get it, kind of fell on deaf ears, but he left us a legacy. The cataclysmic events that took place over five days are forever etched in the minds of those who experienced it over 53 years ago. Sebian spoke with two prominent Detroit pastors who were both nine years old when the civil unrest happened. What was the thing that you remember that really scared you the most or frightened you the most? Well, when you, when you walk down the street and you see soldiers with guns and, and they're drawn, it's like they're out, you see them. Uh, that's not normal. And you see tanks riding down the street, that's not normal. It was still a dangerous time because we had guns and automatic weapons and, and, and military people in the city of Detroit. What led to the tragic loss of lives of mostly young African-American men during the 1967 civil unrest? Some say unfair housing practices with blacks being forced into crowded poor neighborhoods and segregation, among other things. At the top of the list, an unfair justice system at all levels, especially from a certain group of police officers. There was a group of police officers called the Big Four 
which uh, habitually would approach uh, African-American males. In other words, it wasn't possible for African-Americans to uh, converge in small groups without being uh, assaulted by uh, Detroit police. One incident in particular pushed the black community over the edge. The rebellion was sparked uh, by police raiding on a so-called blind pig uh, after our establishment. From there, people took to the streets in protest. Over five days, 2,000 buildings were looted and burned, including Black-owned businesses. The total property damage was close to $45 million. 7,000 arrests were made. Hundreds of families were left homeless, with more than 1,000 innocent bystanders wounded. And 43 people were killed. An investigation ordered by President Lyndon Johnson cited racism, discrimination, and poverty as the causative factors. After the rebellion, city officials were determined to right the wrongs of the past, and many residents were hoping for a new Detroit. James Wilson captured the rebuilding of Detroit, the only photo of its kind in the exhibit. It's a powerful image, and this shows black people pitching in, shoveling up, and beginning to start their lives anew. Yes, the rebuild. The rebuild. With the rebuilding of Detroit came improvements in the economy, fair housing policies, and even the election of its first black mayor, Coleman A. Young, who opened the door for a more diverse police force. But do the threads of systemic racism still exist in Detroit and around the world? Many still believe it does. The death of George Floyd, an African-American man killed by police during an arrest, ignited a global powder keg of protest against police brutality and other social injustices. When we look at Black Lives Matter, and we look at the atrocities that seem to be happening on film between the police and the urban community, you ask yourself the question, are we returning back to where we were? And then some people say, Bishop, it's never changed. I'm like, wow. What do you think, in all honesty, is it gonna take for us to come together in unity? police community, African-American community, not only starting in Detroit, but just within our nation. I think actually moving where law enforcement uh, are not using bullets, but using another type of uh, weaponry that would not kill someone, but could uh, sedate them, I think would be a very positive development in terms of how do we treat each other uh, in this country to value a human life. Several religious leaders are praying to correct the mistakes of the past in order to move toward a unified future where we may all live together in peace. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. I believe that the best prayers focus around you being better and not everybody else changing. So Lord, change me. What would Jesus do in relation to the issue of race? If he was walking this earth today, what do you think he would do in order to help to bring us together? He would do what he's already done. God took one blood and made all nations. I think if the church understands that, what God did was for everyone. For God so loved the world. They didn't say he just, God so loved the Hebrews. They said he loved the world. Now the church, I believe, has to anchor that. Well, we live it again. And, you know, didn't uh, Santayana say those that won't learn the history of of uh, the lessons of history are doomed to live them again. Mm -hmm. And we're living it again. There's a spirit of violence in our land. And uh, some of it is justifiable. Obviously, the police brutality that brought the death of George Floyd was horrible. Um, and uh, other abuses. I I've seen it in our local community here a long time ago. And uh, but so much has been corrected. And we have to realize that we still have the greatest nation on the face of the earth, and we cannot destroy it. It's a big mistake. Terry? Well, a new fear is emerging with the COVID pandemic, the fear of famine in dozens of countries around the world. Countries like Kenya, where the economic fallout from the coronavirus is already taking its toll. 
But for people living in a slum in Nairobi, something called a sack garden is now becoming their lifeline. Take a look. In the heart of this Nairobi slum, families are struggling with the effects of the COVID-19 lockdown. Before COVID-19 hit our country, my husband and I were both employed. He worked as a welder while I was employed as a cook at a local school. But because of the pandemic, both our workplaces were closed. This left us without any source of income. Even before the lockdown and the job loss, Joyce and her husband Boniface had a tough time providing for their children. As a mother, there are times that I would get very worried because I did not have any food at all in the house to give to the children. But I never lost hope. I kept praying to God each day that he would provide for us. Right before the pandemic hit, Operation Blessing gave Joyce and many other families supplies to start their own sack gardens. The gardens have been a lifeline to Joyce and her neighbors as they've harvested vegetables for their families. The sack garden started thriving just as COVID-19 hit our country. We believe that it was God at work. He made the garden thrive just when we needed it most. Because of Operation Blessing Partners, Joyce and her family have a source of food during this worldwide crisis. Thank you so much, Operation Blessing, for this sack garden. You came just at the right time. I don't know what I would have done without this garden. God bless you so much. Joyce had hope, but she had no idea how they were going to survive. And then, if you're a 700 Club member, you made it possible for us at just the right time, because God's always on time, isn't he? To be there with a solution, with an answer, not just for Joyce, but with that whole community. So we want to say thank you. This is what can happen when we're united. Unity brings blessing. So unite with us, won't you? Join the 700 Club. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and it's a free phone call to do that. Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. You just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. When you do, we want to say thank you for caring about other people by sending you this DVD, Do You Need a Miracle? It's full of amazing stories of God at work in the world today that will encourage you. In fact, this is Josetta. She lives in Norfolk, Virginia. She has watched the DVD. She says, Do You Need a Miracle? has truly been a blessing to me at a time when I really needed to see miracles happen in my life. Thank you so much for this timely teaching. So here's an opportunity to be blessed by Do You Need a Miracle, but also to bless other people, both here at home and around the world, as you just saw in Kenya. Be a part of that. 1-800-700-7000, 65 cents a day, $20 a month. Time for okay, some email. Are you ready? Okay. This All first right. one comes from Pat. Patty, Pat, she says, should a Christian sell wine at wine tasting parties and recruit other workers who hold leadership positions in the church? This must be like one of those yeah, self-business well, things. Whatever it is, uh, folks, here's the deal. If somebody is an alcoholic, one drink of wine will set that person off and destroy his life. That's the way it is. Now, as a Christian, you can drink wine, Jesus drank wine. Uh, he talked about, I won't drink this new until I drink it in the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, there's a lot in there, the wine and people in, in, in Germany drink beer and so forth. But alcoholism is a dreadful disease. And if somebody sees you drinking wine and takes a drink of wine himself or herself, that could destroy that person's life. So the whole idea is you don't use your freedom to destroy somebody else. And you say, is it okay to do it? I, I really think, no, it shouldn't be. You shouldn't be out selling wine, whatever the, uh, the, 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 the deal is you're this involved in. Business opportunity or whatever. Yeah, right? whatever. I mean, but as a Christian, drinking a glass of wine with a meal, there's nothing wrong with that. If, if your conscience doesn't condemn you, you know, that's the deal, okay? This is Alyssa who says, I'm 13 and I've been a Christian about my whole life, but 2020 is the year I've really become closer to Jesus. When I grow up, I want to travel around the world telling of our Lord and Savior. This year has been really crazy. Do you believe this is our last year and that <laughs> Jesus is coming in 2020? Are we in the tribulation? 
Uh, I think uh, over the years with the destruction of Rome, people thought the tribulation had come. Uh, I, I, th I don't think we're in any tribulation. I think the Lord will give you something. But, you know, the Bible says occupy till I come. And that's the deal. You, you don't have to sort of spend the time con contemplating what to do next. I mean, you just live your life. And if you go and witness for the Lord wherever you are, bloom where you're planted. Even at 13, there are plenty of people around I, you that you can plenty share. Plenty of kids. That, I mean, if, if you're a witness for the Lord, it'll be marvelous. All right. This is Gary who says, Pat, why does it say in James 1.13 that God tempts no one? Why does it say in the Lord's Prayer and lead us not into temptation? Uh, the Dred Scott's edition of that says, let us not be sifted. And what he's praying is, let, let us not be sifted. Let, let us not be uh, put into the devil's torment that he would uh, sense, uh, uh, tempt us. But, uh, uh, we, of course, you're not supposed to tempt the Lord. You know, that, that's a totally, totally different thing. God doesn't tempt anybody with anything. All right. This is Julius who says, Hi, Pat. Is it all right with the Lord if I'm not able to continue paying tithes due to my income decreasing? Uh, I tell you, if you're smart, uh, you will give and you will watch what God will do. And when the money leaves your hand, it gets into God's hands and He has a multiplication factor that 30, 60, and 100 fold. So um, it isn't a question, is it a sin not to or not to? Uh, you know, we're not compelled to give. We give because we love the Lord. Well, that's all the time we got. Thanks for those questions. We leave you with the words of Jesus from the book of John. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Tomorrow, actress Natasha Bure talks about her faith, her famous family, and her new film. So Great. that's... Look forward to that. You can look forward to it, and you will be here, and we'll see you at our next program, so don't miss it. God bless all of you. For Terry and me, see you later. Bye-bye.